from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Each year, an estimated 100,000 people visit the West Virginia State Museum and Culture Center in Charleston. In an effort to inspire, educate, and enrich, the center showcases the state's history, culture, and art, and hosts a variety of festivals and other events. It's also home to West Virginia Public Broadcasting's internationally acclaimed radio show, Mountain Stage. The center is overseen by the West Virginia Division of Culture and History, which is dedicated to the preservation, protection, and promotion of the state's heritage. In addition to locating and gathering objects, documents, and other archival materials, the division identifies and cares for historically significant structures and sites around the state, forging ahead in its effort to preserve West Virginia's story. We only have one past, uh, and when, when it's gone, there's no way of, of recovering it. So we need to be as capable and as devoted stewards of the past as possible. The history belongs to everyone, and so we really strive to preserve it for everyone. A few miles north of Moundsville, West Virginia, is the city of Wheeling, once a transportation hub and manufacturing center in Western Virginia's Northern Panhandle. It enjoys a rich history. The National Road, a gateway to the West for thousands of settlers, reached the Ohio County town in 1818. The highway connected the Potomac and Ohio rivers and allowed goods from the Ohio Valley to move eastward while fostering westward expansion. Rail transportation came to the city in 1853 when the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad connected Wheeling, Virginia to Pennsylvania, Maryland, and other markets in the Northeast. On May 13, 1861, Western Virginians loyal to the Union gathered at Washington Hall for what is now known as the first Wheeling Convention. During the three-day meeting, a crowd of more than 400 considered a future political course for the region. In the likely event, the Old Dominion seceded and joined the Confederate States of America. On May 23rd, voters ratified the Ordinance of Secession amid claims that Western Virginia ballots were lost on their way to Richmond. On June 11th, delegates returned for the second Wheeling Convention which soon moved to the U.S. District Courtroom of the more spacious Custom House. Built of sandstone near the banks of the Ohio River, Wheeling's Custom House was designed by federal architect Amy Young and completed in 1859. The Italian and Renaissance structure is unique in its use of an interior cast iron support system, later used in developing skyscrapers. We're so glad to have you all here today. This building had three purposes when it opened in 1859 as a federal building and was the first federal building in the state of Virginia, west of the Allegheny Mountains. It served as a post office on the first story, a custom house room on the second story, and a federal courtroom right here on this story. The third floor included spaces for judges, marshals, and a library. The second story had offices for the clerk of the court, district attorney, steamboat inspector, and collector of customs. There was a group of fellows who hid themselves in this building with the intention of stealing what was in the vault. At that time, $1,250,000. It is certainly conceivable that if these robbers had simply tried the vault door instead of trying to break in, they might well have found it unlocked and gotten away with everything. The lock wouldn't work.
now called Independence Hall, the Custom House served as the Capitol building for the restored government of Virginia. Today, it's considered the birthplace of West Virginia and is under the care of the West Virginia Division of Culture and History. Here in 1861, conventioneers implemented a plan conceived by Marion County Attorney Francis Pierpont to reorganize the government of the Old Dominion and clear the way for Western Virginia's legal dismemberment from the state. According to the U.S. Constitution, in order for a new state to be created from an existing state, the existing state has to give its permission. Do we hop in a stagecoach and take a road trip to Richmond uh, through the Confederate lines and try to get John Letcher to sign off on this thing? No. Instead, on June 14th, conventioneers unveiled their Declaration of the Rights of the People of Virginia, considered West Virginia's Declaration of Independence. This is your Declaration of and in that declaration, the delegates call for a reorganization of the government of the Commonwealth, which of course gives us the restored government. Uh, among other things, they declare that those office holders in Virginia who have joined the Confederacy have vacated their positions, and these gentlemen have seen fit to restore that government and fill those positions. And so that's a very important document that came as part of that Second Wheeling Convention. Members voted as one to establish the restored government of Virginia, consisting of Union loyalists elected to public office in 1860. Also unanimously, conventioneers chose fellow delegate Francis Pierpont to serve as the restored government's chief executive. For all intents and purposes, Virginians were now subject to one of two governments, depending on which army controlled a given area. Despite the success of federal forces in securing Northwestern Virginia for the Union and establishing a training camp and military prison in Wheeling, tensions remained on edge in the Northern Panhandle. There is a rumor that begins to circulate in the city of Wheeling that Governor Letcher of Virginia is sending Confederate troops to seize the Custom House in Wheeling. Now this spreads like wildfire and within a couple hours, hundreds of people converge here on the Custom House to prepare for its defense members of the state legislature actually formed a militia unit. And you can imagine these politicians in their top hats and their silk coats with outdated flintlock muskets performing muster drills. They are committing treason against the state of Virginia. And if it were not for those military troops creating that buffer zone for these statehood makers, they might have been hanging from lampposts throughout Wheeling. Amid threats of kidnapping and worse, Governor Pierpont sometimes felt it necessary to send his wife and children out of harm's way. From 1861 to early 1864, a dozen soldiers stood guard at the Custom House as Pierpont and other officials oversaw the restored government. This was the courtroom of Judge John J. Jackson, Jr., who was known as the Iron Judge. And up in this very courtroom were held debates and proceedings that led to first the formation of the restored government of Virginia and then the government of West Virginia. The court still continues. John J. Jackson still presides over the court. He's still holding trials. In many instances, he's trying Confederate sympathizers and supporters for treason during the same time period that the restored government is using that courtroom for the legislature. As chief executive, Pierpont continually grappled with matters of war. Daily, this man has a stack of things on his desk to deal with about raising troops, supplying troops, about rebel movements. There are instances of murder, uh, people who are suspected of being spies. What is to be done with prisoners of war? He has to keep abreast of all these things. I don't know how the man slept. I really don't. In August 1861, the Second Wheeling Convention adopted a dismemberment ordinance providing for the creation of the new state of Kanawha. In a public referendum, voters ratified statehood on October 24th. Between November 1861 and February 1862, delegates renamed the new state West Virginia, extended its boundaries, and drafted a constitution, which voters approved April 3rd. On May 13th, 
the restored government of Virginia formally consented to the formation of the new state, calling for language in West Virginia's constitution, assuring gradual emancipation, the U.S. Senate approved statehood on July 14th. On December 31st, President Abraham Lincoln approved admission to the Union. On April 20th, 1863, he proclaimed that in 60 days, West Virginia would become the Union's 35th state. Then on May 26, the electorate overwhelmingly ratified the revised Constitution. Two days later, Wood County Attorney and Convention Chair Arthur Borman was elected to serve as the new state's first governor. Early on the day of June 20th, 1863, all the officers of the restored government and those of the newly elected West Virginia government met at the McClure Hotel for breakfast. There is a 35-gun salute by the Union troops, 35 young girls sing the Star Spangled Banner. The churches throughout Wheeling rang their bells for about 10 minutes. A new federal building replaced the Custom House in 1907. Purchased by an insurance company, the structure was altered and over time housed a bank, liquor store, nightclub, and offices for a glass manufacturer. In 1964, the state purchased the building and for a dollar a year leased it to the West Virginia Independence Hall Foundation, which raised money to restore many of its rooms to their 1860 appearance. What we do hope and plan is take off the top floor and the side, which were not part of the original building. We do hope to restore to the way it looked and make it a place where exhibits of historical materials would be available and where people could see in living form the type of life and the place in which our state was born and perhaps relive for a small time at least the atmosphere in which West Virginia was born. Administered by the West Virginia Division of Culture and History, Independence Hall has served as a museum dedicated to the saga of West Virginia statehood and the Civil War since 1979. The site joined the National Register of Historic Places in 1989. To learn more about historic preservation, visit the West Virginia Division of Culture and History on the web at wvculture.org. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting.